guy there. All right. Thanks a lot for the for accepting the paper for the conference. Uh, this is a paper with Avinash Dixit. And uh, it's really not on the, um, on uncertainty or an economic policy. So what I really did uh, in between is I, I actually Googled my paper, and it does have, the, even though it's not about uncertainty and economic policy, it does have the word economic <laughs> policy <laughs> and uncertainty, so I think I'm okay. <laughs> so anyway, so, anyway, so um, like, you know, Five years ago, you would say that the euro maybe will break up at the Hill Commission and, you know, like in an asylum. But now, a lot of people think that it's a real possibility. So the idea is that we want to measure the option value that it could be on uh, the breakup of the euro. If, if anything, that's a contribution of this paper. It's not a particularly good paper about the advantages the uh, disadvantages of having the euro, but we think that we could make a bit of a contribution on measuring how much more pain you should take before abandoning the euro. And hopefully that could be more or less correct, even though the model is not the best model to think about advantages and disadvantages of having the euro. So we're going to model the eurozone as individual countries that have some flow benefit that is independent of monetary policy and some flow cost, which will be the inability to do something with their monetary policy for shocks that are individual that are specific to the countries. So we think that that's like a relatively standard view of what some of the costs. Um, we're going to model the breakup as to be irreversible and subject to large fixed costs, so both things. So I think the reversibility is a, a bit of a stretch, but the idea is that it will be hard to uh, mount a project like this, say, two months after, so we're going to take a point of view of it's really irreversible. Uh, we'll I'll talk more about the fixed costs as I write down the little model. Um, so because of this, because of the irreversibility, then, you know, uh, it's kind of like a real option problem that you want to, you don't want to exercise it right away when you're just indifferent. You want to wait a little bit more, and that will be really the, the point of trying to get some idea of that, how much more you want to go from the point in which the fixed cost is equal to the next present value of the benefits. Okay, so... Now, sort of like a sketch of the model and the findings. So we're going to have uh, some version of Europe, of the Eurozone, that has a common monetary policy. So it could only offset, uh, ag you know, Euro aggregate shocks because it will be the same policy for everybody. Um, we're going to have something that, is in the, that affects the desirability of, of our modeling of monetary policy that will be some deviation from the ideal point that they like to be in their monetary policy that will look like an AR1, like a continuous time version of an AR1. So think of this as something, we call it like nominal misalignment in the paper or maybe some version of uh, uh, deviations from PPP. You know, things are expensive. It's sort of too expensive now in Greece, in Greece relative where it should have been, and only slowly they're coming back to normal, that sort of idea. Uh, we're going to use a very simple kind of reduced form static model of cost and benefit. So I'll write it in a second. So uh, we're going to use look in the literature kind of in macro to sort of calibrate the parameters of very, this very simple uh, uh, loss function. Now I think that this is not so much that we chose this. Uh, uh, we're going to okay. We're going to model the eurozone as a fiscal and monetary union. I think if you think about it from the point of view of the theory, this will be very similar to, like, uh, say, uh, warning some fiery model of uh, uh, fiscal and monetary union. It's not so much that we wanted to do that. As, you know, it will be interesting also to model the sort of incentives of individual countries and stuff like that. That's actually harder. So the truth is that we're going to model that as a fiscal union with transfers within just because it's a model that is easier to do and hopefully it still will, will have some interesting results. But, you know, if you want to conceptualize it, it's something like, you know, Europe already gets their act together in terms of doing some fiscal transfers. But there is still the fact that they can do monetary policy, you know, country by country. Um, okay, um, we're going to have, like, a brief discussion in the paper about also the incentive of one country to get away from the euro by itself but most of it is going to be about either you keep it all or you break it. So the breakup will mean that then every country will go by itself. 
So the benefits of the breakup, uh, and now I'll, I'll, re I'll remind you this in notation, is that the benefits is you could tailor the monetary policy for yourself. The losses will be that you will lose the part that is not related to monetary policy, and that these are the cost and benefits. Okay, so what are the findings? I mean, these are not quite the findings. I'll just give you some numbers and stuff, but the idea of the three type of findings. One is that, surprisingly to us, we find a relatively small but not negligible option value in the sense of how much more you want to weigh, how much more pain you want to take before abandoning. We thought there will be more. It's not that big, but I'll show you whatever we find out. You can make your own uh, guesses, but we thought it was, would be bigger because we're more, we have a lot of uncertainty and, you know, option value type of, smaller than what we thought. We also find a very, that uh, if you want to deter one individual country to leave, actually you could put like an extra cost and it's not that big. That was also surprising to us. This, this comment may not be clear because it's not clear what I mean by one individual country, but I'll, again, the idea is that most of the time we think that either you have this already set of countries that get together, they solve as if we're one single agent, but then suppose that they want to prevent one country to leave. I'm thinking like, yeah, actually something more like Germany is the one. <laughs> anyway, so maybe like an extra cost for one country could prevent it to do that, and a very small extra cost, that's kind of a finding. And a third finding is we've, there's a result that is surprising to us in terms of option value, in terms of the comparative statics of the size of the range of inaction relative to volatility. We think it's a new result that is surprising and we get a new characterization. That, I think, could be interesting beyond the particularity of this. It's about, you know, do range of inaction become bigger or smaller with volatility? And it's just not monotone. Anyway, so these are the three things. So at the end, I hope I have some sort of numbers that some range of values that I could contribute here and some characterization here. Okay, so there's actually a large literature kind of in macro about the cost and benefits. And, um, but there is actually small literature on the breakup. So we are actually on that. But let me just skip this since interest of time. OK, so here's our model. So it's really very simple, a bit embarrassing. Stuff. OK, so at N countries, there will be something capital X that is some state of the nominal shock. Think of this as something like a maybe cumulative, kind of like the price level type of thing. And then they fall, it follows an R1 in continuous time. So it mean reversed at the rate mu. So mu, mu is a positive number minus mu. So the rate is mean reverting. It has some shocks with variance sigma i. So dW, so w will be a, wi is a Brownian, a standard Brownian independent across countries. And wc is a Brownian that it hits all the countries at the same time. Sigma c will be the common variance of the aggregate shock, and sigma i, the variance of the individual one. Actually, the common variance, that part is kind of a side issue. It's a bit of a false generality, but anyway, it's there just to prevent questions. I mean, you'll see it. I mean, you'll see it. Uh, then there is a, a Eurozone common monetary policy, and that's going to be denoted by capital Z. So think of this as what the ECB is doing. And then the effect on each country will not be x, but it will be a small case x, which is big x minus z. So the idea is that kind of what affects this country in terms of nominal variables will be some exogenous thing that moves up and down, and then monetary policy could change it. Okay. Now, this doesn't have a meaning yet, but the idea is that the flow utility for each country will be u of i x i. So the idea is that the best point to be is when xi is equal to zero. So you not to have, you like to have xi, xi equal to zero. So that's kind of some sort of bliss point. And if you could actually target the z, you could make xi equal to zero every single period. And that will be the idea that if you have an independent monetary policy, that will be kind of the model. Now, while you're in the union, ui of zero will be strictly positive. So that means that if you are within the Eurozone and you just happen to have at each country have a little x equal to zero, so it's the best possible point, and on top of that you are in the Eurozone, you are kind of happy because you have a strictly positive payoff. If you break out the union and then you go by yourself, 
you could ensure to have little x i equal to zero every single time, but then you lose the constant, so to speak, of the function u. So that will be the trade-off. So the idea is there's something good about the, the uh, eurozone that is not related to tailoring the monetary policy, and that's the level of this function u. Okay. And because each country has, the, and, you know, and, and there are several, because each country has their own x, then z could only tailor something like the average. And, okay, so that's that idea. So if you break up the union, then there will be a fixed cost, which we're going to denote by capital fee. So if you go through this kind of like fiscal union, then you will do some weighted average of the cost and, ben the cost and benefit. There will be some transfers on the back, so that's, but they're not going to show up in the objective function, these transfers. And then at the end, what you're going to be doing is, in each period where you are in the union, you're going to be looking at setting the Eurozone policy, the common policy, trying to make this as, you know, as large as possible, adding the utilities of all of them. That's this idea that you will decide this as a union. So. You could think about some weights in initial period and then carrying this plan, and then potentially deciding under what circumstances to break up. So that's a stopping time tau. And then when you break up, you pay the cost, fee, and then remember the normalization is that u of zero is zero. So the flow value after you break up is zero. So that's why it doesn't show up here. So, so actually, that, this is it. That's what we're going to be solving. So, you know. So let's just talk about things that are not here, which are very many, and there will be even fewer because I'll specialize it more. So one thing that is not here is nothing about sort of, uh, you know, kind of one country trying to please one country that wants to leave. So there's nothing like that. Actually, that's kind of in, there's very few papers that will break up. There is a paper about that by Lippi and Fuchs in the review. But, you know, the, by nature of that, these papers have to be kind of simplified a lot in some other dimensions. So this is this idea of a fiscal union, that you have sort of commitment and you carry this plan. Again, it's kind of what is simpler to analyze, not really somehow will the idea. But the other one will have to, okay. So that's what's not here. Uh, now, the solution of this is still a bit too hard we'll, for us. We'll specialize a little bit more. Yeah. No, no. Well, think about the aggregate price level. So, uh, you know, there's some, there's some, there's something about the the price level that you like to have in each country. But some countries have a little bit higher. Some countries have a little bit lower. So, when you choose whatever action to make the right price level, you're going to be, you know, being too high from one and too low for the other one. So, I will answer yes. It does focus on the aggregate, but you know, they're, they're pulling you in different directions. Because some countries would like to have, if you want, this is really more expansionary policy. Some countries would have more contractionary policy. But, you know, so they have these different UIs. So you are going to be only doing the average. Yes. It's a single. Uh, correct. Correct. Yeah, yeah. What, what is not true is that you, it's because of this transfer and commitment, it's not that you have to, you want to steer the policy more towards one country to keep it, to make sure that this country stays in, that sort of thing. Because you really, you sign a treaty. Correct, correct, correct. Yes, that will show in the UI. Exactly, but uh, you know, it, it, next slide I will take it out. I'll then make it symmetric, and then I'll talk about the symmetries at the very end only. But you know, it's just I just put it because it's easier. Otherwise, you don't see the summations without the sub i. What, what is the question of x? Why? No, obviously, yeah. well, this well, if you looked at, it depended on which what do you think that x is. If you think about something like exchange rates, the idea. A real exchange rate is that they mean reverse slowly, three to five years. 
So, so you think of this as the real exchange rate. That would be kind of what we want to think. Now, with common nominal exchange rate is really the accumulated price level, it will tend to mean revert to something after a shock. Correct. Yes. 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 It will get. So we actually we did it because we thought that we thought that the the type of variable that we're going to use for this is real exchange rate. So the idea is that things are too expensive in one country, too cheap in the other one, and somehow if you could have like a monetary policy in each of them because they have sticky prices, you will do something so that the real prices get to be correct. But if you leave them by themselves, they tend to mean revert, but relatively slowly. So real exchange rates have a mean reversion, typically half lives of five years or so. That's sort of, you know, there's if, I mean, this is gonna be, it's a very simple model, so that will, will be the reign of precision. No, we'll do it with or without mean reversion, this one, but. Yes, yeah, there's more hope. But there will be hope oh, anyway, but, uh, but there's even more hope, yeah. Anyway, we did it because we thought it would be reasonable. That's a true, but. Okay, so now we're gonna specialize it even more. So, so basic, okay, so first notice that the, okay, a few words. So notice that the solution for this, you have an, um, you have two, two points. You have a control Z that doesn't affect the law of motion of X. So that control you will decide in each point with, uh, is completely static. And essentially, you're going to try to hit the average deviation. That's one sort of simple point. So that's why it's a little bit of a side issue. Take on. Uh, so the solution for this is you looked in some, so if there are N countries, you looked in some N-dimensional space, and you would say, okay, around here, close to zero, then I stay. Far away from zero, I leave. Like, you know, if some countries are very out of whack because they're, they became too expensive you know, or really, really too cheap, I break it up. Or if in average, there are some, too, you know, you add a lot of deviations, you also break it up. So now we're going to specialize things, so, but we, can't, we couldn't really do the really n dimension, so we'll specialize it in a way so we could do this in one dimension. So this is actually an n-dimensional stopping time problem that's kind of hard. So we're gonna put something so we can make it into a one-dimensional problem so it's easy, easier. Okay, so the, that is the following. So I made a comment about Z. So that's what you solve Z. Regal, you know, it, it doesn't matter what the SCB does right now in terms of the future because, you know, if you break it up, then each country will have their own central bank, so it doesn't really tie anything about the future. Then we're gonna have quadratic utility. It has a constant, remember, the constant is how good it is to be in the, in the Eurozone if somehow all the deviations will zero, all the misalignments will zero. And it has some sensitivity, which is how painful it is not to be on, on top. And then it's a square, because the idea is that it could be because it's too expensive, it could be because it's too cheap. Because of this quadratic, it's kind of trivial to see that what you will do with x, z, is that you will actually target the average x, and hence the little average, little small case x will be zero in the cross section at every, every moment of time. This is actually like in, uh, I'm just looking at Oleg because he's discussing Ivan's and, and, uh, and Emmanuel's paper. That's actually like the result in the paper anyway, so. So, you know, you, you won't have like all countries with possible X or negative X. In fact, this will add up to zero. Now, it turned out to be that in this case, what you could do when you go through this sum is that you could add all the X's, and then you add all these X's square, and this process will become a one dimensional Markov process. So, that's kind of where you get the tractability. So even though it is an n-dimensional process, it has a representation as a one dimension. This representation of one dimension, I mean, you could always add n numbers, you know, 10 numbers and become one number. The point is that somehow you don't have to keep track of all the innovations separately to know where the guy is going to move tomorrow. So that's a trick that we're going to exploit. You could always add it. The thing is, and notice that this is a one dimensional innovation. And what you're trading off is now there is some uh, heteroscasticity, 
And then there is n minus 1. I'll talk about this in a second. And then you get the mean reversion here. So why is like a casting of a vessel process, but not quite a vessel process? OK, so n minus 1. So z is no longer in the picture. Why? Because in some sense, having n countries is like having n minus 1 with the optimal monetary policy, because you could always target something above the average. That's why there is an n minus 1. This is not like a proof or something, but I try to you why there is n minus 1 in the expression. That's kind of the idea. Now, why there is a minus, OK, y is, is a positive guy. It, it likes to go up because the squares, they add up. But the mean reversions bring it down a little bit. And that, that was Jesus' point. And then why is it heteroscedastic? Well, because if all the deviations will be 0, you add small numbers to the square, and they are very small. So that's why there is this term. I'm doing like Ito's lemma and adding stuff that fast. That's what I did. That's the only thing I said. Anyway, that's the idea why you have this process. So the thing is that now we have become a one-dimensional process. So now we're going to look at this one-dimensional uh, problem. And you know there's only positive. So the idea is there will be a, a value, y bar, at which you will abandon. And that will be a combination of perhaps you know, some of the squares. So maybe all, you know, half of the country is uh, high, half of the country low, or maybe one country with very large deviation, say the southern countries with very large deviation, and the other ones with small deviations on the other side. Whatever combination that gives you that the sum of the squares hits a critical value y bar, then you will break it up. Yeah, but you can make mu equal to zero. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, because all the parameters being kind of the same. Right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. That's very important. Yeah, I mean, reversion being linear, all the having the same utility, uh, you know, the same, the same yeah. parameters. So you have idiosyncratic shocks, so all the parameters are the same. Otherwise, you will not have a one dimensional representation. Sorry, I, I, I misunderstood. OK, so, okay, so now we solve a, sli a simpler problem, which is this one. And the solution of this problem will turn out to be uh, finding this y bar, this number. When you hit this number, then you will break up the unit. OK, fine. So we want to kind of find out that number, get an idea, get some parameters. And think about compare that number. So what is that we want to do? We want to compare that number with a sort of more static calculation on when the cost and benefits are equal to each other and look at the difference. OK, so I guess. It, there's some way of doing it. We have like a, actually, with a lot of patients, you could kind of find a solution of this. I mean, like writing down. But I'm not going to get to it. So actually, the shape of this would be useful to make some arguments. So you know, the typical thing is that this, this is just record keeping. While you're in inaction, this follows this equation that is just keep track of payments. And then when you hit the barrier, then Remember, you pay the cost, and then you get 0. So that's the one boundary condition. And the other one is a sort of so-called smooth pacing. OK, fine. I'll, I'll, OK, there's a figure. There's a reason why I'm showing this figure. I know that either you know this figure, and it makes no sense. Or if you don't know, you're, but, but, but it will come back to something useful, I, I promise. So this is sort of like the, the, this is the value. This is the height. You will see it's value matching, it's smooth pacing. You see that it's flat. And remember, this is the sum of the square deviation. Remember that the x's without the squares are up to 0, but obviously with the squares, they're always non-negative. OK, fine. First surprise to us, and that's why we are going to go to the third, is the following table. The numbers here, are they are really more made up than the rest. So these are just for illustration, OK? So don't pay attention. I mean, you know, some numbers. So the numbers are kind of round. But look at the table. The table has sigma. So different columns, mu's, different mean reversion. And then the number inside is y bar. So this is sort of like no, no, no uncertainty. So fix mu, mu equal to 0 is a random walk. So you have like n random walks going on together, and then you stop it. OK. So you have higher sigma, then y bar goes up. Then higher sigma, y bar goes up. Then look at this value of sigma. No, no. So 
Look at this value of mu. You have a higher sigma, it's kind of the same. So the barrier doesn't change. Then look at this value of mu. Higher sigma, and the barrier actually comes down. So this says that the range of inaction actually is coming down with sigma. So it's mine. <laughs> so it, and it's next to the microphone. <laughs> the, so, okay. <laughs> okay, so. Okay, so we're thinking, you know, we probably, this is a mistake on the code or something, so we are coding. Okay, so no, it's actually correct. So the, the typical result we were used to is that you increase sigma and then there's more option value. So the set of states in which you, in which you wait is higher. That's just actually not true in this problem. Okay, so. Okay, a bit of an explanation. Uh, so let me propose something else to measure option value and then give you a, a kind of two pro a proposition about you know, how it works and an explanation. I mean, so why I'm saying this because, you know, so then to start to think about this will be really weird. Eh? When we get more higher sigma, then we will think that then if it is more uncertainty, then they have to stay in the euro longer. So what's going on? Oh, you know. A bit of an explanation. So I think also this may be also interesting for people that work in option value independently of this. Okay, so, so first, think about a different problem now. For a second, just tell me this will be useful. Think about a different problem. We're gonna call that this a now or never problem. That is the following. You, you have some state today and you, and you think, okay, I either abandon the union now or I never abandon it. And then think about which one you like to do more. And then find the threshold for that. So by construction, that problem, we will say, I mean, this is our argument, we say that argument, that problem has no option value because once you decide it, you will never, you are not allowed to revise your, your decision. You see what I mean? I, we're making this, this up with, with Davinesh, so it's not that it's something, so I'll say it again then, yeah. We're gonna call it now or never, just to give you the, so the idea is that at a given moment of time, you decide, look, today is a special day. It's the day that you either break it or you keep it forever. It's like, you know, as death apart. So you know, it's like, now or never? And you decide it. So you could say, well, I break it up or not. What would you, what would you say will depend on, on why, actually? You could find the y bar, oops, sorry, we call it y hat, that makes you indifferent. So this is a different threshold, and it's a different problem. It's a problem that we will argue, I'm arguing right now, that that problem has no option value because I'm never allowed to revise my decision. Okay, now compute the, this guy, and that guy is that formula, that's a matter of the formula, but you know, it's decreasing in sigma. So the reason why this is decreasing in sigma is because the period return function is concave, so variance is bad. Remember, it's a square, you have, you know, it's a quadratic function, so with a square, so more variance, more instantaneous, okay, so. So what happens then with the result? What happens is that when you increase variance, there are two things, there's a direct effect on the, on, the, on the payoffs, and then there's kind of like the option value. And what happens is that higher sigma it has more option value, but it has more also the direct effect on the payout. So you kind of have to take the difference to measure what we call the pure option value. Yeah, yeah, I mean, well, sometimes dominates, sometimes not. I'll give you a theorem on why it dominates and one other uh, characterization. But I, you know, I'm arguing that this is the way to measure it. Wait, 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 because I can see that you're, you're it's not gonna be the result here, so. Yep. Yes, size here. It's, it's a two-sided, if you, we're doing it in squares, but if you're doing it in level, you're abandoning on this side or on this side. Yeah, 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 but that's like, uh, wait, it's easier to have a discussion so I, once I have a theorem, because I feel that I have like an unfair advantage, because I have like a theorem here, and it's all like, <laughs> so anyway, so this is mu, this is the same table as before, then, then I have the y bar, and then I subtract the y hat. And then you look at these numbers. Well, first of all, they are zero, there's no uncertainty, better be the case. And then now these numbers are decreasing, as they should. 
So I'm arguing that that's kind of the way to measure the option value, to compare this now or never type of problem, the threshold that you get from the threshold that you get with a problem that has both features. And in fact, that's what we need to measure when we think about kind of the breakup of the euro. Because the idea will be, what is that you will decide if you do kind of the myop, or, I don't know, uh, say the now or never, or the myopic decision versus this one. Now let me get into the reasons so it's easier to, to, to get to that discussion. So here's a characterization of the solution. Now first, I want to do some normalizations because there are, there are actually fewer parameters than what it look like. So y bar and also y hat, both of them, they're a function of n, the number of countries, and three parameters. So first is, notice that there's a flow cost alpha. So there's a flow benefit alpha. There's kind of like a cost beta. And then if you abandon, there is phi. So if you multiply the three by 10, nothing really changes. You just change the units. So obviously, some ratio will, the decision could only be a function of a ratio. In particular, it's a function of this ratio. And that's also, I think, economically very intuitive. Well, I can't do things. Oh. So what is this? For the point of view of the whole union, what is the cost of abandoning? It is. You paid. You give up alpha forever. So that's, so that's alpha divided by R. is paid by N guys. Because, you know, by not having the union, you're not having the alpha. So the cost is really, it is the same to have phi, to have a larger, really fixed cost which we think of whatever crisis will happen when you do this. So it's, it's the same to have fee or to have fewer benefits of staying in. The, you cannot separate them. So, you know, if you were to divide this by R, so I guess I'm doing this everything in flow, is the flow value of the cost, phi times R, plus the flow value of the fixed cost, plus the flow, co the flow benefits of staying in. This, two, this N times alpha and phi times R, they don't have, like, separate uh, influence in the problem. And because it's homogeneous to the degree one, the objective function, if you multiply everything by 10, you cannot change the results, then you really could divide everything by beta. So when we think about comparative static of what matters, it's really like this number. I mean, you could put in separate numbers, but the only thing that will matter is kind of the total cost relative to the benefit. Remember, beta is how, how much it hurts not to have the optimal policy relative to the economic cost of breaking up, which is the benefits that you're not getting, something say as the trade and the transaction cost, plus the cost of getting really the union, maybe the crisis that will come because you have to redo everything, all the contracts. So theoretically, that's only one parameter. Then there are two more parameters, mu and sigma. There are not three because, you know, everything, if you scale everything by, by time, you know, you just change all the, all the rates. So one is mu, and the other is sigma square. So I want to talk about sigma square, which is the one that I just talked about the comparative static. But before, I'll mention these two, and one of the things that uh, Nick said before, uh, already reviewed the result. So how is mu, mu bar as a function of this cost relative to benefit? Well, you know, if it is costlier, OK, so y bar is increasing in the cost. OK, so you abandon, you have a higher cost. The lower, I mean, cost and benefit. So. And then y bar, the other one that is a slightly more subtle, but not that much more subtle, is y bar as a function of mu. Mu is mean reversion. So if things tend to get better by themselves, you know, if you are kind of in a bad position now, if you wait, it will tend to mean reverse. So that means that you will be indifferent from living at a higher value. OK, fine. The, the, the one that is sort of trickier is sigma, is, the, is relative to sigma squared. OK, well, we actually have a characterization. We have two things. We have an approximation of the solution, and we have actually a characterization of the derivative of y bar with respect to sigma square. So let me go through the approximation first. So the nature of the approximation is that we solve the problem with r is equal to 0 when there is no discounting. This is a well-defined problem in that case, because you know, eventually, as long as the stopping time is finite, you just add numbers, but you don't add infinite many of them, so to speak. So Everything is finite. So that problem actually is easier to solve. So we solve that one. And then we approximate the solution around that one. We do a Taylor expansion of it. So that's this object that is here. I mean, beauty is on the eye of the beholder, but <laughs> <laughs> one thing that you see is that there is some numbers here. 
And well, one thing that you see is that there is this guy, the cost and benefits, 16, which is kind of super obvious. Uh, but, but look, I mean, sigma is here in the bottom, and then there's stuff on the top. And the stuff that is in the top is m minus 1 mu minus r. So the sign of the partial derivative with respect to sigma squared will depend on this. So for instance, if you actually set mu equal to, so two things that you learn. First of all, remember that n minus 1, so this problem also works out in n equal to 1 in one dimension. Now, one dimension is n equal to 2 because remember, we, we, have this, we have this thing that we could tailor the decision, the average decision, so the one dimension is really n equal to 2. So, so this is not about having more than one dimension. It's really mean reversion against discounting. That's really what depends, what gives you the strength of mean reversion relative to discounting is what gives you whether the range of inaction is increasing or decreasing in sigma square. And, and this is sort of like the uh, intuition. I think it's, I think the, it's like a something to write. Like a marker or? That's not, it's a super high tech. So anyway, I'll do it just, I do it like by, so if you think about like, I learned these things in Nancy's class, so if I don't explain it well now, it will be super embarrassing, but anyway. My intuition from why, you know, kind of why bar in the standard case is increasing is the following. You solve the model, you get kind of a smooth paste in there, you're indifferent. Now imagine that you increase variance. So you go a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left. But if you increase variance with a random walk, let's say you could go a little bit more to the left, a little bit more to the right. I'm thinking about a discrete time, discrete state representation. Okay, but so if you increase the, the, the innovation, thanks a lot, the, 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 the innovation, then what's going to happen is that if you go more to the right, you're leaving anyway, so that doesn't affect you. But if you go more to the left, you're getting more inside the good region, the, the value is higher. So think about if you keep the, the same policy of y bar, your value functions kind of goes up, so that's why you will be convenient for you to move y bar to the right. So the idea is that you sort of make an argument why if this was the solution, if this was the solution when you were going a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left, if you take bigger steps, which will be like a way to think about higher conditional variance, this one doesn't really hurt you because you're leaving anyway. This one takes you to a place that is even higher. So this is kind of moving this way. So it will make sense that y bar will be higher. Okay. So that will be true for mu equal to zero for a random walk. Now, to explain you this, let's go to the most extreme case. Let's do IID. Now, I know there's no IID in continuous time, but pretend that there is. So take mu to infinity. So if it were IID, then you're trying to do this argument, but it doesn't work. Because if it is IID, whatever you are today, it doesn't really make any reference to what you're going to be tomorrow. Whatever you are today, tomorrow you're going to go to the unconditional and then move to the right or more to the left. So if it is IID, there will be really no option value. And if it is concavity, you will be just hurt. So it works the opposite. Instead of the value function going up and then expanding this, it comes down. There is really no option value in the IID case. Well, IID is a little bit extreme, but the idea is that then it's a fight between mu and r. The only thing that is actually slightly uh, more difficult to understand is why n increases d. But I'm not going to get into that. So in fact, we have this approximation, but actually we show this result in general, that the derivative with respect to sigma of the size of the range of inaction really depends on r relative to mu. The more mu reversion you are, you actually you change the result. Nevertheless, the difference between the two thresholds is always increasing. So the, what we call pure option value, we made up this word, so, but this we call pure option value is always increasing in sigma. So when we measure it, we're going to do two things. We're going to measure the difference between these two. I'm going to show you some numbers. And we're going to measure also, we're going to take the value function, and then we're going to look at the other threshold, and we're going to see this height of the value function, and see how much you would have lost this height because you stopped it here as opposed to where you should have stopped. So again, both in terms of value and in terms of where you stop it, then we want to make this point. Okay. So 
So enough of this. So now, because they are in countries and because y's are in squares, we're going to normalize things. So the way we normalize it is this way. So y is a, y is a sum and it has a square, so we divide it by n, and then we take a square root. So the interpretation of this number is that it's sort of like the typical deviations. If all countries will have the same deviation at the time in which you are stopping, that's the exchange rate, the devaluation or, or appreciation that you will see. Uh, if you want to concentrate everything in one country, you essentially, since we're going to choose n equal to 5, because we need regions more or less of the same size, you could multiply that number by 2 by making the largest deviation in one country and smaller in other ones. You know, there's all sort of range, but I'm just saying this is sort of the idea. I'm going to show you numbers for the typical deviation. And the gains are this difference, and we're going to choose parameters so that uh, this is expressed, UI is expressed on deviations for GDP on, uh, after the breakup. So if you divide it by n, will be the GDP of a given country. So this will have the, I'll, I'll, okay, let me put it this way. I'll make some choices on the units so that when I talk about values, they will have the interpretation of percentage of GDP. So it's, it depends on where it makes sense, but you know, I'll make the choices so that that, so let me show you some, let me discuss sort of the type of numbers. So, and five, well, five, well, we have a model that every countries are symmetric, so what can we do? I mean, we can do like Andorra, so, because it's very small relative to Germany. So our countries are kind of like, you know, Germany, France, and Belgium, Italy. Okay, so, so that's all. it's a compromise between having the model that is really symmetric and having several countries. Then mu and sigma, we choose kind of relatively conservative numbers because part of the uh, changes on real exchange rates are not that every single change is bad. So this is the type of, you know, sort of values for sigma and for mu. We do like a lot of uh, sensitivity because these values are so non clear. Alpha has the interpretation of per unit of GDP, the percentage increase that you have just because you're in the union, unrelated to monetary policy. By looking at the literature, uh, uh, then we sort of pick up two type of estimates relatively the conservative type, which is the increase because of trade, so there's a large literature when there is a currency union, how much trade increases. And then there's a literature when you have an increase in trade, how much is welfare. So we pick up from that literature. We get something on the order of, uh, for that, we get like 1.5%. Uh, so if you look at Andy Rose type of numbers, these are much higher. So anyway, so, and then we get like half of a percent from transaction costs. If you look at the numbers from transaction costs, they are actually even higher. So the, or, but, Anyway, so 2% is how good it is to be in, in the Eurozone versus not being in the Eurozone unrelated to monetary policy. Then beta, well, you could kind of write like a sticky price model and then get the idea because you're not quite with the right prices. Then you have to pick some elasticities and shares and get the idea of how far away you are from the ideal price. It's a sticky price model. They all have like quadratic deviations anyway. So we choose some number based on that. But let me put it a different way. Beta is 2. What does it mean? Because, you know, in our objective function, we have beta divided by 2. It means that if you have a deviation of 10%, you are, in terms of welfare, 1% below in terms of GDP. So imagine that you, are, you have accumulated 10% more inflation than what you would like to have. And suppose that you could have actually reduced that instantaneously. That will give you a welfare benefit of about 1% of GDP. So if you were to take 10%, and somehow you are 10% above on cumulated price level, that's what this beta means. Fee over n, fees pay for the whole breakout, the per country is 20%. So this is what we think by reading the literature when there are these crises in which country has a, flex, a fixed exchange rate and then it gets out, try to average, and then actually we took in the conservative side, what is the, the, the loss in GDP in a multi-year period, converted into one period. So this is 20%. In fact, this has a small, this is a small number relative to this one, in fact. This is actually, in the beginning of review, properly discounted and added up, the flow one is actually twice as big as the other one. Yeah. Exactly. 
Yeah, the idea of you didn't have really convergence, and the other one is the mean reversion. Yeah. 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 Or or the or the PPP because you have a common nominal exchange rate. Yeah, but we also put this from some other experiences we've, we uh, we discussed it in the paper with where they have fixed exchange rates. Exactly, your deviations are zero. You don't even care about sigma. No, you don't care. The model is bad because you know after that you are in nirvana, so you are always on top of it. Right. Right, I mean, yeah, but I'm just saying the Eurozone is a relatively recent phenomenon, but there have been many other instances of uh, uh, fixed exchange rates. Anyway, so, so I have a bunch of figures and tables, but let me just summarize them. So, so the normalized stress or Y, which remember it has interpretation, like what would be the kind of average, some country going up, some country going down at the effect or on the, when there, is a, when there is a breakup, it's some number like 25%. That's actually not that different from, just by coincidence, but it's not that different from what happened in this crisis. In fact, they're typically bigger in this crisis, but this is actually, they were more or less evenly distributed across countries. Then the difference between Y bar and Y hat is kind of small, also about 5%. So if you were doing calculations and thinking about, I'm using like my favorite new Keynesian model with 27 adjustment costs, blah, 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 but it's all linearized and I do my calculations, here's yes, I want to leave, you have to err about 5% more. That's kind of what we think that you should learn from here. Oh, stretching or? Yeah, no, no, oh. I had Yeah. Correct. No. Right. Yes. Yes, exactly. That, that's what the transfers will do. Yeah. Yeah, so we are not, I mean, you know, the model is actually the quadratic deviation stuff, but that's, I think, the best interpretation. We're actually trying to write like a simple model that will be about that, but then probably it's calibrated, will be calibrated in different ways. It's not. Yeah. It's the, yeah, I mean, we wrote like a quadratic deviation of something because we wanted to do something that we could really solve. And then we look for what is the, I mean, I'm just being honest, about what is the best type of uh, explanation that we could get. And it's just a typical Mandel type of idea, not the depth. So the benefits of the option value are 4%. It's a one time 4% uh, uh, annual GDP which we thought they were small, but anyway, so that's, that's what we, the type of numbers that we get. Now, if we were to say double all the parameters or half of them, then the range of this will be that these thresholds could be maybe 20% bigger. As opposed to 25%, maybe we could get to something close to 50%. And these, maybe we could get up to 10%, but not much bigger, you know, sort of. And remember, you know, you're putting, you know, you're making a loss that is very big, it's 2% in perpetuity for all the countries, plus 20% drop in GDP for like a, you know, for a year, and still you get not much uh, um, option value. So very briefly, so let me not just explain sort of the, another calculation that we did, which I don't have a lot of time to explain, but it's the following, which we were also surprised. So you take one country, and now say call it Take one country, say, say, take one country, and then you, you think about this country, and then you, you don't give transfers. So now this country is not equally happy now, because sometimes with the transfers, you're making everybody. So you look at a country that doesn't get transfers, and if it leaves, it pays just his share of the fixed cost. Then this country will be worse off. Staying in, so you compute it as if it will stay in the union, there will be sometimes will be worse off, because you know, it's not getting any transfers. So what we compute is what would be the extra cost that you had to impose in this country not to leave, and it's a small number. It's 1% of GDP, Re relative to say the 20% that is the breakup cost. So instead of having a crisis that is wipe up, 
in a multi-year period, say 20%, if you wipe up 21% for this you know, deviant country, you could keep it in. So the point of that is that uh, actually we think that probably is not such a big deal that we didn't do it a country by country. Yeah, to, to once. No, once. If you, basically, if you impose an extra cost, if you do it as a flow, you have to take 5% of that, say, as an interest rate of 5%. So it's really, you know, on the order of five basis points every year to keep it. So, you know, we'll, we'll, so let me conclude. Actually, I'll show you this because... Let me conclude. So, so then, uh, so we think that there was this surprising to us theoretical Arizona option value that optimal threshold could be decreasing in volatility, but yet option value properly defined is increasing in volatility. We think that this may be interesting in some other for some other applications, and it's really something about mean reversion in this uh, in this setup. Uh, also, we found small but non negligible value option value on the order of say you know. A one-time loss of 4% of GDP, if you didn't do these calculations, or like uh, maybe, you know, a misalignment. If, if you think about, you know, how much you tolerate, maybe you should tolerate five, between five or 10% more per country. That is to say, again, if you actually solve it without thinking about that, if you put like 5% more or so, then probably you will be fine. And then the fact, something that was surprising, I didn't have time to explain the nature of the exercise, but the idea is that this was either everybody break up or everybody stayed in, but actually the incentives for individual countries are not that different. So we actually kind of developed that and using the same parameters try to measure it, and we got a, a sort of a small difference. So if we were to do like more like a game where we actually get to see everybody staying in, we think that it will, things based on that will not change a lot. Ah, okay. Actually, we computed that is very large. So, uh, you know, we compute expected times, condition on being on Y hat of hitting Y bar, for instance. And it's rather large. We don't understand that why it's so large. On the order of 10 years or so. So if you make the calculations kind of like naive, then you're probably, in average, uh, you're you are breaking up 10 years earlier. Oh, yeah, yeah. I just give you the, the mean. Um, I don't remember this person, yeah. But it, it, I co computed the mean because we thought that, and it's 10 years or higher depending on the parameter. 10 years is kind of on the minimum one. So, you know, you, you could compute being here, think about the stopping time of actually first time that you hit this one. So you left too early. But, you know, if there are shocks, you could be hanging on here, here. What is the, in one realization you get here. Okay, so then you compute the stopping time I get in here, condition starting here. And that number is the smallest we could get is on, on all the parameters that we looked at, is ten, which we think that it could potentially be reasonable, is 10 years. And it could be as high as 100 expected times. So we don't quite understand why that's so different. But um, just given the question and that you're kind of smiling before, you probably guess. What's a, what? Well, there are many. No, no. So you could have one guy that goes one way. That's that's the M. That's where the N. The so the N. So I, I, I the formula is in the paper. But to give you an idea, when there is no mean reversion, the formula for the expected. Um, for the expected lifetime, if mu will be zero, is this one. So the point is that it's increasing in n. Because there are many ways that things could go up. It could go back for Greece, it could go back from Spain, it could go back. Yeah, with mean reversion, the time is, is. No, with mean reversion, it takes longer. No, because you are here, and with mean reversion, you're marching in average there, so it's higher there to get there. And I just, but I'm just telling you that one thing that why this is true is because N makes a difference. Because things could go back in different ways. It could go back for Spain, it could go back for Italy. So, and then one, one of them becoming with the squares very large, that, then you have to exit. Remember, it's the sum of squares.